body parts have been discovered across Hertfordshire. The most likely explanation for what's happened is this is a sadistic ritual killing. A murderer is playing games with the police. No one had come across this before. Is it the same victim? Was this a serial killer? There were so many unknowns in this. I certainly was losing sleep over it. This offender is very forensically aware. They know how to hide evidence. There's always going to be a chink in their armour and it's down to us as the professionals to find it. The forensic scientists will have to go to unprecedented lengths if they're to catch the killer at the crime scene. Police have received a 999 call about a suspicious package discarded in a field. I was the on-call detective sergeant for the Hertfordshire murder team. I think I was eating my dinner at home and got the call that they'd uh, they found what they believed to be uh, a severed left leg in a very rural location, completely the opposite side of the county from where I was living at the time. A local farmer has discovered a small holdall on the edge of his field. Inside, a human leg wrapped in blue polythene and sealed with duct tape. It was routine really to be called out to suspicious deaths and bodies, but body parts, um, certainly not. That was the first time for me. Detective Sergeant Ian Siggery races across the county to Cotterid. Cotterid is a lovely, lovely village. It's Middle England, as I would call it. Really nice rural location. So quite a concern for the residents of Cotterid. Ian and his team cordon off the country lane and the vicinity around the discovered body part. Finding an item like this in a lay-by, the CSIs, we have to cast it like really wide and recover any recent and non-recent evidence from that lay-by because we don't know initially how long that item's been there for. There might be discarded items that might have fingerprints on or DNA on wrappers or drink cartons or cigarette ends. Initially, once we found the left leg, we were of the opinion that probably within that locality we'll start to find other body pieces, but of course we didn't. Everything that we harvest from that initial crime scene is bagged and tagged, and then it goes back to our incident room. Everything went into storage till such times as we could decide what would be our most fruitful exhibit to send off, whether it's DNA, fingerprinting, chemical work. Always going to be crucial for us was the wrapping that that leg was in and, of course, the hold or that the whole thing was in. To identify who the limb belongs to, DNA samples are taken and run through the national database, whilst the packaging is forensically examined at the lab. Finding a body part wrapped in plastic with tape around it immediately gives me forensic opportunities. It gives me the opportunities of maybe finding DNA on the tape or fingerprints on the end of the tape, and also fingerprints on the plastic. The initial examination of the rubble, sack and tape provide the police with no clues. Had no forensic evidence on them. There were no fingerprints, there was no DNA, which then makes our job very difficult. This offender is very forensically aware. They know how to hide evidence and trying to disguise who they might be. All of the routine inquiries that we carried out in Cotterwood really came to no avail. No one had seen a car parked in the lay-by at the material time. No one had seen anybody dumping anything in the side of the field. So we were none the wiser, really, when it came to Cotterwood. The results are in from the DNA samples taken from the limb discovered in the hold all. Unfortunately, it came back as no trace, so the body part remains uh, unidentified. It was quite disheartening, really, because we knew that if we identified who our victim was, then naturally the offenders would, would, would follow very soon thereafter. The pathologist did, however, make an observation about the efficiency of the amputation. Whoever carried out this dismemberment had done so in a very, very professional way. We were hypothesising, well, was this a medical amputation? 
experts tell us that the dismemberment itself was very skilled, clinical and professional and that indicates that there may have been some prior experience or practice in dismembering bodies. It requires great anatomical knowledge to cut at precise cutting points, so that may be part of the medical profession. It could be working in a butcher's. Seven days later, another gruesome discovery. The second call came in again on a Sunday. A couple found a forearm uh, just at the side of the road in Wheat Hampstead. When the call came in, I was sure that would be obviously linked to, to our leg. The leg was found in Cotteridge, whereas we're now finding a forearm in Wheat Hampstead, which is the other side of the county. Both scenes at Cotteridge and Wheat Hampstead were very similar in being very rural and not overlooked by, by, by any residential properties. So this was the second deposition site. So it's approximately here that the left forearm was discovered by the couple out walking on that Sunday morning, literally just laying at the side of the road, just off the grass verge. So we believe it had probably just been launched, maybe just out the car window. You would identify it as definitely a male. It's quite a hairy arm, very professionally severed at the hands and cut off at the elbow, but it was all very cleanly done as if someone had done this before. How long had it been here? Had it actually been deposited before the left leg a week before? We, did, we weren't to know. At this early stage in the inquiry, all we knew, it was definitely a white male, but that was it. So male and ethnicity, nothing else. So now we've got two crime scenes, two potential dump sites of body parts. I would, as a crime scene manager, try to look to link the two scenes together at the same tire trap marks at the two crime scenes. We would do this by photographing them. And then also, if they were good enough, we would take a plaster cast of the tire trap marks. It's important to keep all options open at a crime scene like this. And although tire track marks aren't the best bit of forensic evidence, we don't know if they're going to be relevant or not. So it's really important to recover as much evidence from the crime scene as possible. We're able to measure the distance between the two tracks to work out the potential size and the type of vehicle potentially and depending on how worn they are, depends if they've got unique damage in them or not, and whether that unique damage has been replicated in the actual tire tread. You know, we're not gonna have any eyewitnesses to the deposition. We've got no CCTV. House to house inquiries are gonna give us virtually very little. We knew we'd probably find a link eventually, but what was it? Was somebody deliberately trying to be sporadic in their deposition sites just to throw us off the scent? It's possible that the offender didn't have great concern for being detected by the police because we can see that the body parts weren't necessarily hidden. So we're looking at somebody who is likely to have been looking to exert some control to achieve some sense of power and recognition and reward, send the authorities in different directions. Was this a serial killer? Was it organised crime? Was someone playing games with the police? We just didn't know. And not knowing is a concerning thing. 48 hours later and 100 miles north, Leicestershire police have discovered a skull that's been stripped of all its flesh. Of course, we believed it was going to be linked. We dispatched a team up to Leicestershire to liaise almost immediately. A killer is on the loose. Members of the public have discovered a dismembered leg and a forearm dumped in Hertfordshire. And Detective Sergeant Ian Sigri and his team have now been called 100 miles north to Leicestershire, where a skull has been found. The skull was found in a farmer's field, completely void of any skin, of any flesh, unlike all the other body parts. So we believe that the offenders had carried out the removal of all the flesh and the skin to that skull. 
a sort of midsummer murder type scenario with a leafy village in the suburbs of Hertfordshire and they find a leg and then we find a forearm and then a skull in Leicestershire so it really had gripped the nation. A killer who appears to have almost taunted the police and courted publicity by scattering body parts far and wide. There'd been huge media coverage nationally with these body parts turning up. It was on all the news bulletins. The most likely explanation for what's happened is this is a sadistic ritual killing followed by an attempt to generate publicity. It was so high profile that everyone was alert to the fact that they're walking their dog and they came across something, they, they would have seen it in the news that week. Detectives are appealing for witnesses for anyone who saw anything suspicious in these areas where the body parts have been left since the 20th of March. The world was looking at us at uh, Sleepy Hertfordshire. Once again, the forensics sees hundreds of exhibits but there are still no fresh leads. The police are hoping the skull and dental analysis will provide a much needed breakthrough. I think leaving the teeth was a, a real schoolboy error because it really was our best method now of identifying our victim. But of course, we need to narrow it down. We just can send these dental impressions out to all of the dentists in the UK. That's just not a feasible line of inquiry. But we knew that once we had a few more clues, then those teeth would really give us the identity of our victim. Several of our detectives just focused purely on missing persons. We're looking at international missing persons as well. Was this someone foreign to our lands that had come across? We went through hundreds of missing persons throughout the UK, and it was a big piece of work for the inquiry team. And if they did fall within our criteria, then we were going out visiting family and relatives. Every missing person inquiry that we, that we looked into just drew a complete blank. When it came to it, it didn't hit the complete criteria that we were looking at. It was quite disheartening at times because you often say you make your own luck in police investigations, but everywhere we went, we just came to a dead end. We'd failed on the DNA database. We hadn't recovered any hands, so we had no fingerprints to go on. We were getting no luck at all. We were getting no leads to who our victim was, who these offenders were. We couldn't make head nor tail of it, really, to be quite honest. Really didn't have a clue. You begin to doubt your own investigative ability, and the pressure was certainly there, and I, I certainly felt the pressure. And of course, every day that ticked by, those offenders were still out there. As the pressure from the public and media is mounting, detectives turn to Professor Caroline Wilkinson, a specialist in cranial facial recognition. When the police can't identify bodies by the usual channels, then they'll often ask for a depiction to be produced and then that's put out to the public in the hope that someone will recognise them and then that will help the police to identify them. The police delivered to us the computer tomography scans of the skull. We worked from photographs of the original remains and the CT data. We worked on predicting facial features from skeletal analysis and from that we look at the orbits and details of the orbits to tell us about how the eyes sit and where the corners of the eye are and how much it protrudes. For the nose we look at the bones of the nasal aperture and one of the unusual things with him is that the what's called the nasal spine which is a little pointed bit of bone at the base of the whole of the nose is split into two points rather than one and that suggests what's called a bifid nose so that you can feel, but mostly see, a groove up the centre of, of the nostril, and that's an inherited feature. The process we use is anatomical, so we build the muscles of the face directly onto the skull. The shape of and size of those and attachments and origins will be determined by the shape and proportions of the skull. You can see where there are strong muscle attachments because they leave marks on the bone. So that helps us with some of the big muscles of the head to see the overall shape of the face. Once you build the muscles of the face onto the skull, you get automatically get different proportions and different face shapes. So it's a gradual buildup of muscles, then individual features, and then we use tissue depth averages to tell us about the overall soft tissue above the muscle structure to give you the, the skin layer and then that gives you the finished face. As Caroline works around the clock 
to create a depiction of the victim, another body part is found in Hertfordshire. The fourth gruesome discovery in just three weeks. Police have actually blocked off the A10 heading northbound. This gruesome discovery was made in a lay-by by a motorist who stopped at lunchtime and found something in the woods. The police not actually revealing what they have found there beyond the fact that it is a body part. The next call came in was the discovery of the leg in the lay-by on the A10. Main road, the A10 in and out of London, quite a large lay-by, just bordered with farmlands. A big search area for us and an awful lot of litter, cigarette butts, crisp packets, sweet wrappers, absolutely anything that was alien to that rural location was seized by our forensic specialists. The amount of exhibits we had after that fourth scene was, was absolutely enormous. Police have now harvested thousands of exhibits but have nothing that identifies a suspect or links the four crime scenes together. Sometimes you will have CSIs that will work for 10, 12 hours at a crime scene for three or four days and none of their evidence actually comes to fruition, which can be quite soul destroying sometimes. It's at this stage that we would then think even more outside the box and we would consider more unique forensic techniques. We would consult with different forensic scientists for suggestions about what their evidence we might have recovered from the crime scenes. Is there any other evidence that we could potentially look for outside the normal DNA and fingerprints so we would consider fibres? The investigative team came to the laboratory for a case conference to ask for assistance and seeing what kind of ways we could help them in terms of um, any scientific evidence that might help the investigation proceed forward at that point in time as they had absolutely no clue or information regarding who may be responsible for this particular crime or clue as to where the, this individual had been killed or dismembered. During the meeting, we were shown photographs of the body parts in the original packaging as they were found. And what became clear at that time was, whilst the body parts were being placed in these rubble sacks, they'd used gaffer tape or duct tape to actually seal and secure the, the packaging in place. Looking at that, it seemed to me at the time, potential line of inquiry would be to actually carefully remove the tapes that, that used to secure the packaging and see if there was any material such as fibres or indeed any other kind of trace evidence that was present on the adhesive side of the tape lift that had actually been secured or preserved at the time of the dismemberment and packaging. The act of actually pulling the, the tape can create a static charge which attracts any fibres near to it to be drawn to the adhesive. The tape was carefully removed from packages put the adhesive side down onto a clear acetate sheet. It meant we could actually turn the thing over and examine it microscopically to see if there was any material there. What we were looking for was what we call fibre collectives, groups of fibres that appear to have originated from the same source, entities that are probably somewhere between a tenth and a, and a quarter, the, the width of a, a human hair, and less than a millimetre in length. The collectives that we discovered on these sections of tape it turned out to be what we call flock fibres. A flock is what's called a non-woven textile. It's formed by chopping sections of yarn up into very, very short fragments and then electrically charging them so that they stand upright. They have a very distinctive texture to them. They actually, when you, when you touch them, they actually feel like a peach skin. And because it's just stuck down, it's not woven, is it sheds incredibly well. So the information we gave to the investigative team at that time was, if you find a place of interest, look for something that's blue in colour and has this particular peach skin texture to it. Bring it to the lab if you find such an item and then we'll perform a comparison using different analytical techniques as well as microscopy. As the detectives exhaust all the forensic angles, the killer they are hunting provides them a new lead. This is the fifth gruesome discovery in just three weeks. A local farmer alerted police to what's believed to be part of a male torso here at Gore Lane in Standon in East Hertfordshire. The call came in for the discovery of the torso over the Easter weekends. 
torso have been found in a suitcase in Plash's farm, not far from the A10. It's likely to be from the same man whose legs, arms and severed head were found at locations around Hertfordshire and Leicestershire in the past three weeks. The torso went to uh, a local hospital. We had a home office pathologist come out to conduct a post-mortem. That really did give us some momentum on the investigation because for the first time we discovered our cause of death, which was crucial for us. We established that there were two stab wounds uh, through the back, one of which had gone straight through uh, the lung. The discovery of the torso gave us a few more lines of inquiry in respect of it reduced the age for us. So we were able to, to be more specific on our search for missing persons and our media appeal. What police know so far is that he was white or Asian in his mid 40s to early 60s, five foot six to five ten, and large, 16 or 17 stone. The detectives revisit the missing persons national database. And whilst Caroline is completing her depiction of the victim, police are alerted to the recent disappearance of 49 year old Londoner Geoffrey Howe. It was Geoffrey Howe's brother who reported him as missing initially to Metropolitan Police Service, but then again to Thames Valley Police. And as soon as we looked at Geoffrey Howe's details, his age group and his weight, we just knew that this, this could be it. This, this, this could be our victim. Geoffrey Howe was adopted, so they weren't able to obtain familial DNA profile from his brother. So the police have to look at other ways to confirm that the deceased was actually Geoffrey Howe. The police came to us with an image of Geoffrey for what's called a craniofacial superimposition to be produced, where we superimpose the skull with the photograph of, to see how well the proportions and shapes match up. We position that based on where the orbits match the eyes, where the nasal aperture matches the nose, and look at how the jawline fits within his jawline in the photograph. In this case, everything matched up enough that it was consistent we could say, yes, go ahead and try and do an identification. We had two of our detectives taking the dental impressions off to an expert who obtains Jeffrey's dental impressions from his dentist. I think it was about four or five o'clock the following afternoon before we actually officially identified Jeffrey as our victim. When Jeffrey's brother reported him as missing, he said that two people were living inside uh, Jeffrey's flat, one by the name of Sarah Bush and the other one by the name of Stephen Marshall. And as soon as I heard the name Stephen Marshall, I was thinking, well, it can't be one of the same. Police have confirmed that the dismembered body parts they discovered scattered across two counties belong to 49-year-old Geoffrey Howe, who'd been reported missing by his adopted brother. We carried out some very fast-time research on Geoffrey Howe, on his address, on his background, and we actually identified a couple of people that have worked with him. What we can say about Geoffrey, he was a really lovely, genuine man, hardworking, well thought of by his work colleagues and family, worked all his life in the kitchen sales arena, was good at engaging with people, was friendly, portrayed exactly what he was, a nice, nice man. Geoffrey was described as being very kind, caring, open, generous, sociable. He was described as having a heart of gold. When Jeffrey's brother reported him as missing, he said that two people were living inside uh, Jeffrey's flat. Jeffrey took them both in because they had nowhere to live. They were on hard times. One by the name of Sarah Bush and the other one by the name of Stephen Marshall. I'd known Stephen Marshall from very early in my policing career. He and I had sort of grown up together, me as a young police officer and him learning his trade as a, as a criminal, really. And our paths had crossed several times. In actual fact, I'd arrested him one morning with a prostitute for taking drugs, probably six, half past six on a Saturday morning outside a nightclub in Hemel Hempstead. And I'd become really, really excited because I just knew what Stephen Marshall was. 
um, and I knew what he was capable of, we decided that we would go down to Jeffrey's home address on the pretense of a, a basic sort of generic routine missing person inquiry. As soon as that door was opened and as soon as I shook hands with Stephen Marshall, I just knew. Certainly at that point, Stephen didn't recognise me as that young PC from Hemel Hempstead all those years back. But I certainly recognised him because he was quite possibly unforgettable, really. He was a quite an imposing character. He was good six foot two tall, well built. He was well into his fitness uh, several years previously. In actual fact, he had uh, a failed business as a, as a gym owner. I was nervous, but I could see that Stephen Marshall was more nervous than I was. We sat down in the kitchen and I could see his leg just shaking underneath the table. And I just knew I needed to not raise any of his suspicions, really. I had quite a polite conversation, just chatting about himself and his girlfriend, Sarah Bush. And then obviously on to Jeffrey. And where was Jeffrey? Both Sarah and Stephen had said that they'd last seen him in, in February time. Jeffrey had financial troubles. He didn't know where he'd gone, he just upped and left. And he couldn't really give any more detail about that, which straight away was, was ringing alarm bells for me because he portrayed Jeffrey to be one of his best mates. Jeffrey had allowed him to stay in his flat, so surely he must have known where he was, who he was with, where he'd gone. I recorded everything contemporaneously in a book quite deliberately because I knew that's probably going to prove quite crucial in our investigation and later on at court. I could see through him that he was lying, wasn't making an awful lot of sense. I had a look around the flat and there was no bed, uh, which was unusual. There was just a, a blow up inflatable on the floor, which we really couldn't figure out why that was. Uh, so it just wasn't right. I just knew that I needed to leave the flat just to give us a little bit of time to decide exactly what we were going to do. We had a brief discussion and I just said, look, it's Stephen and Sarah. I know it's them. Get them in. We had a number of different officers outside, called them all in. And I just walked in and said, Stephen Marshall, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Geoffrey Howe. He recognised me at that point as being from Hertfordshire um, and said, oh, I remember you now. Stephen Marshall was under arrest, Sarah Bush was under arrest, and then we took them back to Hertfordshire. Are you surprised to learn that Geoffrey Howe's been murdered? No How did you feel when you found that he'd been murdered? No Stephen Marshall refused to answer any of our questions just made no comment to everything he was asked. Are you surprised that he's been murdered? No comment. What can you tell me in relation to his murder? No comment. Do you feel upset by his death? No comment. If he was an innocent man, why wasn't he helping us with our inquiries? Why wasn't he talking? Why wasn't he engaging with us? And do you feel upset by the fact that not only has he been murdered, but someone's chosen to dismember him and place parts of his body around the countryside? No comment. How does that make you feel? No comment. I think Sarah Bush was less comfortable with the cell block environment, less comfortable in telling the lies that Stephen Marshall was. He just knew he had to keep quiet, say nothing, and make the police prove it. Are you responsible for the killing and the dismembering of your no friend, comment. Jeffrey Howe? If so, why did you kill and dismember Jeffrey Howe? No comment. It really was all the circumstantial evidence at that time, but we need hard and fast evidence. We need forensic evidence to say that was the scene. This is the room it took place in, and this is how it took place. The flat was deemed our crime scene. We couldn't really see too much signs of it being our, uh, the scene of the murder. If someone's been murdered as brutally and as horrifically as Jeffrey Howe was, and then cut up into several different body parts, even if you've cleaned up as well as you can, it's highly likely that we will find a lot of blood at the scene, a lot of blood pattern distribution. We would lift the carpets up, would look in the floorboards to see if there's any traces of blood. Forensic scientists use ultraviolet technology to investigate the bedroom where the airbeds were. Once you started taking up carpets into the underlay, it just looked like brown staining. 
forensic team utilised ultraviolet lighting that showed up just an excessive amount of blood. We took off skeleton boards. In the grout in between the tiles, there was an excessive amount of Jeffrey's blood. They'd done a really good cleanup operation inside the flat, but not good enough to stump the forensic team. It was identified that the murder had taken place, we believe, inside the master bedroom. Dismemberment had taken place between the bedroom and the ensuite shower room. Maybe Jeffrey had fallen onto the bed. The mattress and the bed were just covered, very heavily soiled in Jeffrey's blood. So they had to get rid of those. As a result of our house-to-house -house inquiries, we identified a local resident that had seen a male a couple of weeks previously carrying a mattress from Jeffrey House block of flats to a local bin store. It was fortuitous that on the day of the arrest, that resident was at home and saw us walking Stephen Marshall out from the flat. And she identified in a witness testimony that the bloke that she had seen carrying the mattress those weeks previously out to the local bin store was the same person that we'd arrested. They had to blow up beds, replace the heavily soiled mattress. We now needed to link the missing beds, the blow up bed, to the death and to the dismemberment. And that was where the fibre work came in. Unbeknown to us at that time, the material on the blow up beds was going to prove absolutely enormous to the investigation. Dr. Ray Palmer identified various fibres in the duct tape used to wrap the first limb that was discovered in the blue rubble sack. If he can link the body parts to Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush, it will be a massive win for the investigation. The phone rang from one of the investigative team to say that they found a potential source uh, for these flock fibres. We immediately asked the investigative team to bring us these items so that we could take samples from it and compare it to the collective uh, of fibres that we found on the tapes. This source turned out to be an inflatable mattress which had a plastic substrate which obviously inflated. But on top of that, there was a layer of dark blue flock. Being on a clear acetate sheet, it meant we could examine it microscopically. We take representative samples from the, the areas of flock that were on these items. These are then placed on a comparison microscope, which allows you to look at the reference sample from the mattresses against the fibres from the tapes that, that used to secure the packaging. In the event that the comparison microscopy shows no differences, then we move on to the next uh, analytical stage, which involves the use of an instrument called a microspectrophotometer that compares the colour between the question sample and the control sample. Again, any differences, you would exclude it. In the event that you cannot exclude these samples by this form of comparison, then we move on to another technique called Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, which compares the chemical structure of the fibres down to the molecular level. Throughout this process, we've used this whole battery of comparative tests. And in each test that we performed, there were no differences between the sample. Consequently, we were very confident that these inflatable mattresses were the source of the collective fibres that we found on the tapes. Those blow-up beds must have been in that room at the time that Stephen Marshall dismembered Jeffrey Howe, wrapped up those body parts prior to discarding them. What they were actually doing was sealing in evidence relating to that particular environment. They would have been unaware of that. Once we'd identified and compared the flock collectors from the tapes, we went back to the tapes to see if there was anything else present. And we found a number of green polyester, as well as maroon polyester collectives. Stephen Marshall had been known to wear some green polo shirts that had embossed with his old uh, gymnasium that he once owned. The thorough search of the flat leads police to the laundry basket, where they seize Marshall's clothing. Polyester fibres had a quite distinctive feature, and it's what they call flamed ends. It's essentially when the fabric's made, it's passed under a, a heated surface, and it melts the top layer of the, the polyester fibres to give it a, almost like a stay press kind of appearance. Under the microscope, the fibres from the tapings from the body parts 
exhibited the same features. All the analytical um, tests, they were indistinguishable. It was those two items seems actually that proved really, really um, just brilliant on the, on the forensic evidence. It's a bit like the numbers in a lottery. The more numbers you have, the less likely it is that it's going to be a chance event. Given the amount of fibre evidence that was found on the adhesive tapes, demonstrates a very little knowledge about fibre transfers or about and indeed fibre evidence and, and how useful it can be. I believe he was a friend or an associate of yours. No comment. And my understanding is he's been quite kind to you in the past by allowing you to stay at his home address. No comment. You would expect anybody that had been accused of murder to, to shout from the rooftops that I'm an innocent man, that I didn't do this, and especially as the fact that Geoffrey Howe was supposedly one of his best mates. Just weeks before his death, Geoffrey had told friends that he felt he was being used by Marshall and Bush. It's reported that Geoffrey became more and more impatient as time went on, and it got to a point where Geoffrey asked them to pay some rent and they refused. You've called him, he's not returning your calls. You do see him on the 6th. How did he appear on that day? He seemed really lost. In what respect? Just didn't know what to do with himself. Just said, have you got that money for the rent? OK. I think. He appeared different to normal then? Yeah. At the point at which the relationship between Stephen and Geoffrey soured, it's possible that Stephen decided that he wanted to almost eliminate Geoffrey so that he would still have access to the housing and the money and the food um, continually in the future. The physical forensic evidence is painting the picture of what happened to Geoffrey. Meanwhile, the digital forensic team makes discoveries which suggest the reason he was murdered. Well, our motive was to plunder Geoffrey Howe's assets. Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush have been charged with the murder and dismemberment of kitchen salesman Geoffrey Howe. Police must now analyse the digital forensics to prove the motive behind the murder. Post-charge, once Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall were locked up on remand in prison, the investigation just picks up pace, really. The telephone work takes time. We need to get that lawfully from all the service providers. We got all the data back from Jeffrey's phone to prove that that had stopped working on the Sunday, which was the day, probably the day of his murder. The handset was then sold by Stephen Marshall the following day on the Monday. They'd sold Jeffrey Howe's car on eBay uh, several days after his murder. And we'd identified where that car was. We'd uh, obtained witness testimony uh, from the person that purchased the car. There was a handwritten receipt for the sale of a vehicle, and you can get really good fingerprints from paper. If the fingerprints are really fresh, you might be able to use certain magnetic powder on the paper, which will also develop any fresh fingerprints. So finding fingerprints on paper again would then potentially tie an offender to a transaction. You might also be able to use a treatment called ninhydrin, which is a chemical which turns fingerprints on paper into a purple colour. Scientists apply ninhydrin to the receipt, which reacts with the amino acid of the fingerprints, which subsequently turn purple. Several of the fingerprints revealed were a positive match to Stephen Marshall. Detectives investigate Geoffrey Howe's bank activity, which further supports the motive behind his murder. Sarah Bush had paid off a, a Cineworld account. She had opened up a Little Woods catalogue account, made different purchases, tried to sell Geoffrey Howe's dining room table. It's worth about four or five thousand pounds. They had completely plundered his bank account. Stephen Marshall had written out about eight checks, some to himself, some to Sarah Bush, and six or seven checks to a friend of his that he owed 800 pounds to. In terms of taking petrol without paying for petrol, selling Geoffrey's car, ordering regular takeaways, cashing checks in view of CCTV and so on. 
There's a juxtaposition with the very organised, planned, meticulous element with the killing, dismembering and distributing of body parts versus the frenzied uh, spending spree that ensued. And perhaps that was an element of not being able to defer that gratification, so having sudden access to these resources, namely money, and wanting to go out and use them. They, in some ways, stopped thinking things through so fully and comprehensively and were almost distracted by the easy access to money. At that time, we knew that Stephen Marshall was the owner of a Seat Toledo, and that was forensically recovered back to one of our labs. Painstakingly gone through both the fibre work, fingerprints, DNA, and to harvest all of the exhibits out of that car. Forensic officers compare the tyre track casts taken at the deposition sites to the tyre tread of Marshall's Seat Toledo, but there is no match. However, what they discover in the boot of the car will be crucial to the investigation. We were just blessed to eventually find some blood. I think it was a worktop sample that Stephen has carried around in the boot of the car. And they found some staining on that and sent it off for DNA analysis we were able to link Geoffrey Howe's blood to the boot of Stephen Marshall's car. That vehicle must have been used to transport the body parts across Hertfordshire up into Leicestershire for the deposition. We were able to do cell site analysis to track both Sarah Bush and Stephen Marshall up the M1 motorway, up towards Leicestershire and back again on the particular day that we say they deposited the skull. The trial was held at St Albans Crown Court. And I've got to say that when I saw him in the dock, he seemed to be a bit of a shadow of his former self, really, because I always saw him as a very imposing man. He appeared to me to be a broken man when he was sat in the dock. Stephen Marshall said, nothing to do with me, it's all Sarah Bush. But the telephony worker told us that Sarah Bush probably wasn't at the flat at the time of the murder. At the time of the murder, we believe that she was away visiting a friend. The compelling evidence against Marshall finally brought on a confession. The evidence was so overwhelming that partway through the trial, Stephen Marshall just threw in the towel, gave up and realised that, that he was going to be convicted uh, and he pleaded guilty partway through the trial. It was so rewarding to hear that Stephen Marshall had actually said, yes, I did murder Geoffrey Howe. That was great for Jeffrey's family, it was great for the public, uh, but it was good for the team to know that you know, we were right all along. The murder charge against Bush was withdrawn. She was sentenced to three years and nine months for perverting the course of justice. Having confessed to the murder and dismemberment of Jeffrey Howe, Marshall told the court he had also dismembered other bodies. What we had evidenced was there was a, a, a firm link between Stephen Marshall and a well-known North London crime family. And other witness testimony was obtained whereby Stephen had told people that in actual fact he had carried out other dismemberments on behalf of this North London crime family. And this wasn't his first time. And this is why he'd become so proficient at dismemberment. Stephen Marshall was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 36 years. Certainly one of the most high-profile investigations I'd ever been proud to be part of. It was a real team effort. We were blessed to have a real quality bunch of detectives on that case. It's never about one detective, it's all about the whole team around. It was really rewarding for the team. All the hard work that everyone had put into that case uh, came to fruition. Stephen Marshall was a dangerous individual. I learnt lots from that investigation and above all, probably learnt always to, to go with my gut feeling. One thing that came out of the investigation and speaking to lots of family and friends of Geoffrey Howe was how Stephen Marshall and Sarah Bush took advantage of Geoffrey Howe's good character. All Geoffrey tried to do was to help them and be friendly towards them. Just so sad that his life was taken away so early. The new series of Inside the Force 24-7 continues. Officers called to a fight at a funeral Monday night at nine. 
Action and Adventure wraps up this evening on Channel 5, a kickboxing Alicia Vikander pushing herself to extremes as Lara Croft in Tomb Raider in just a moment. <laughs>